I I feel that it would be it would have been completely valid to have had a character and almost any if the character had been about someone trading silks on a planet and they ne went through the whole novel never mentioned the person's sexuality so what I wouldn't care the only reason it occurred to me was because that was what the book was specifically about mm -hmm. and not having that struck me as being a cop out as severe as never showing Spock going through Pawn Far and mm -hmm. and, and uh, yeah, you know, so search when, for Spock. It's when, like, what a ripoff. When Left, Hand, <laughs> when Left Hand came out, it was a conceptual breakthrough. And when you look at it now, recently, you're able to see, uh, you, you look at it and you see, like, what dates it. But okay. if you look at it in, like, 1968 or, or 69, basically you had one of the first major SF novels to deal with sexuality, admittedly in a very intellectual way, but it was also in a very challenging way what because it dealt specifically with the union well, what was aspect of the male-female within you, but she literalized it. But what was challenging book. about it was the fact that she took something that made audiences comfortable, the way you expect a human being to be portrayed, mm -hmm. and then she made a twist on that. And she took an aspect of humanity and made it very different and made it important. Mm -hmm. And so, whether we like it or not, that character is going to stick out in our minds forever. Mm -hmm. And that, I think, is the key to developing any good male or female character, is realizing that, yes, they're going to have a bend in their action that's been shaped by their culture somehow. Perhaps, let's think about, for example, aliens, we always come back to that. <laughs> but, <laughs> but it's true, you expect a woman to be nurturing. You don't expect a woman, in order to be nurturing, to pick up a gun and... I didn't expect it, but I considered it to be 100% believable. Yes. And yes. I embraced it completely. Yes. yes. Ripley was a real woman. But it was still a ba twist Vasquez, on, on the expectation Vasquez of the Vasquez was a man right. with breasts. Uh-huh. Ripley was a woman. You know, and I, I... Well, the movie wasn't about Vasquez. Uh -huh. That's right. No, all I'm saying is that Vasquez was just another jock. You know, mm -hmm. there were the jocks who were being men in one way or the other and out macho one another, and then there was Ripley, whose, whose mm -hmm. motivations and actions were those of a woman. Harrison Ford, in Witness, mm -hmm. takes on an almost feminine persona during the most important part of the movie, that climax, protecting that kid, mm -hmm. protecting that woman. I mean, well, yeah, a, but whole, I don't see, I don't a whole that. different bend from what he was at the very beginning. Well, part that's of the, that's the a twist on your expectation of how a man is going to act in that situation. And I think that's very valuable to realize what the stereotypes are and how you can go against the grain. I didn't, really, I but I didn't, I didn't see anything really that Ford did in that film as being like an expression of a feminist or a nurturing nature. And to me, it's very logical that somebody who has fatherly feeling, I mean, f the feeling of a father is in many ways not that much different than the feeling of a mother. I mean, I don't, I mean, there's got to be less than 1% difference. That, that's I think that fathers are a true. little bit more interested in the accomplishments of their children and the mothers are a little bit more likely to just accept their kids and love them. It's like fathers tend to get a little bit well. more bonded to their kids after they can walk and talk and interact and do. And mothers have that kind of boom. Well, they they say that Prince game. Charles isn't going to care for his kids until they start winning rugby matches. Yeah. It's the thing. See, but that's, 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 again, but that's how he was raised. Well, one of, the yeah. stereotypes, uh -huh. one of the stereotypic things is that women can be, but men must do. You know, and of course, a human being should have aspects of both. One of the I was in a conversation with a lady today. We were talking about one of the stereotypic, once again, differences between men and women is that men are judged by how well they perform, and women are judged by how well they display. Right, it's a stereotypic thing. Changing right. very rapidly in our society now. Now Good. everyone's being judged by what they do, and but by their display. how that's transplanted into what they have. Well, we don't expect say, uh, male <laughs> stars to be better looking now than male stars were, you know, 50 years ago. They, they have just better had bodies and all sorts. Right. Of they just had yeah. to look like men back mm -hmm. then. That's right. But there was a, there was a comment in the paper about you know the Zoe Baird controversy, which was uh, who was that? Oh, Zoe Baird was the uh, first nominee for Attorney General. Oh, right, right, Who right, hired right, the illegal right. alien. Right. Like she had to, basically, yeah. she had to make a decision real fast because she needed somebody with, with child care. Anyway, until there was an editorial that somebody wrote in the paper, they're always telling other people how to live their lives, of course. Uh, they said, like, well, her husband earns big bucks, and she earns big bucks. Why couldn't one or the other of them stay home for two or three years and raise a kid? Therefore... They would not have a problem. It's not a monetary thing. Well, no, it's, it's not a monetary thing, but the person who wrote the editorial obviously didn't realize that for Zoe Baird, to, to choose between motherhood and being a housewife and being a career woman was a, an impossible choice. She's not built that way. That's right. She has to do, she had to do both. 
Yes, there okay. are women uh -huh. today who are demanding to have the opportunity mm -hmm. to express themselves in this way, and it's you know it is completely. I mean, I think that there have been a lot of women throughout history who would have much preferred to go out and, and produce in the world, to create, to express themselves in those ways. In much the same way, there are a lot of men who would prefer not to compete, who would like to just oh, yeah. be gorgeous, you know. Uh -huh. But you almost never see this. If Roseanne Barr marries someone that no one's ever heard of, she brings him into the business. She turns him into a producer, a partner. One of the few men married to a powerful woman that seems to be nothing more than a housewife, per se, is Elizabeth Taylor's husband, who seems to function and wonderfully to take care of her. He seems to function to take care of her. Almost invariably, a powerful woman wants a man who is displaying as much or more power than, sh than, than she is. Very rarely will, will a woman hook up with a man who simply displays well just because he's pretty. He's got to do. It, it mm -hmm. falls back to that dichotomy. Women are, you know, it's, you have cheerleaders who display and the football players who do. Women are not as attracted to men who just stand up there and shake their butts. You know, for every... Oh, I don't every, know. There, there, there is, there is one <laughs> chip... More stereotypical behavior. Yeah, right. there, there's one Chippendales for every thousand strip joints. There's one yeah. Playgirl for every thousand, you know, men's magazines. Women are not as interested in just watching men shake it. Uh -huh. they, they're interested in watching... You know, it's like if you have your typical TV series will have women walking around in skimpy bikinis and men running around doing things. Yeah. You know? Well, this, this you sort of... I, I don't know if anybody out there is as old as I am, but... I mean, I can see such a tremendous change between old science fiction and the male and female ro mm -hmm. roles and what's going on what, now. What, what is the difference that you see? Well, it, uh, well, let's see, more so in horror, I guess, in science fiction. Science fiction has always maintained, I feel, a higher level of uh, real male and female characters than, say, horror. Horror was mainly the macho and the bimbo, you know. The bimbo runs into the haunted house and goes, oh, save me, save me. And, you know, the macho man goes in and, and fights well, the girl. Killed. And gets killed, <laughs> right? Killed, yeah. uh, but that's part of the, that's part of, that's because of the old uh, gothic tradition, and you still, and you know, it's it's still with us. Or even if you look at a film like, like Hitchcock's Suspicion, I mean, basically it's a gothic. Well, right. I have it's never seen a, well, a slash em up horror movie yeah. where the last person left alive was a man. I've never seen it. And the, invariably, if there's only one person left alive, it's going to be a woman. Yeah. You well, know. I have to think about this as a historian <coughs> for a second because okay. that's my training. Um, most science fiction literature is very, it's, it's the modern period. We're in the postmodern mm -hmm. now. Before technology was the star. Uh, now technology is not much as much of a star in our information right. era as the people who can pull together information using technology. Are we seeing that change in science fiction on television? I think if you look at Deep Space Nine, we certainly are. Mm -hmm. What do we have there? Oh, well, I thought the big yeah. change in Deep Space Nine was that Roddenberry was dead. <laughs> oh, no, I think... <laughs> well, we won't yeah. mention that one, but no, no, anyway. No, 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 I mean, what do we have on Deep Space Nine? We actually have a powerful black commander. Oh, it my God. It does not matter, you know, his color, his, his beliefs, anything. And he's, he wear you know, for all of his strength, he wears his emotions and is caring for people on his sleeve where you can see it. We have a woman character who used to be a man, okay, out, mm -hmm. out in the open, right. which is our yeah. little Dax character there. Yeah, that's right. Uh, we have one alien who's really a wonderful, powerful woman. It's interesting. We have a lot of aliens that display very human emotions, which is a problem, but we've had a few that have actually been a little alien and difficult little to alien. understand. You must keep in mind but on the, the original. star of that show, the technology they are exploring is not the technology of space flight. It's the technology of human interpersonal relationships and how we react and how we learn and how we grow. This is sociology, psychology, and history that we're seeing as the new science. Okay. Well, so, yeah, but mm -hmm. see, like, I think if you use... <laughs> anything associated with Star Trek, as an example, you have to realize that you're, you're talking about these saints on really their most, um, oh, on almost the lowest, the lowest common denominator no, Trek because the show the is best of S so the best well, SF ideas. There are a lot of good no, ideas. In Trek. No, they, no, they, no, they're not. No, no they're not. not. They're, they're all, no, not we're, a we're one. exhibiting not a one. opinions here. In my That's opinion, true. I thought for a while Trek was at the forefront of uh, of media science fiction. Ideas. Media science fiction, sure. Yeah. And media yes. science fiction, sure. But I mean, like often when the ideas, when the ideas have been around long uh -huh. enough to get to the media, they're old hat. I mean, the media, film, and television, both. I mean, if you look at them all throughout their history, have drawn most of their ideas, except for, except for the fact of like telling stories purely with camera, 
from either the stage or from novels. Well, that's because yeah. it was the speed of information transmission. Now that we have, for example, Joe Straczynski going up on a Writer's Guild board or going up on CompuServe or Genie and having people immediately give ideas and say what's new in science and technology, what's happening. We're getting feedback this instantaneous. Feedback. That's going to change. Is, we didn't have well, that in 1966. No. I don't really you know? <laughs> yeah, but I don't really see that as having anything to do with the art of the show. I mean, it may yeah. help him think about stuff. Okay, we're but getting I mean, slightly away yes. from the subject here. Yeah. 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 But I'm what, talking, what I was talking about is, in a way, uh, we might look at science fiction and fantasy and think now that it is, it is a little bit more female in nature, that we're, we're going after the softer science. No, okay. we're not. No, we're not. It's not. It has nothing to do with male or female. It has to do with yuppies. No, really, it has Which to are do, asexual, by the way. Has, no, has, no, the thing about, <laughs> about Deep Space Nine and Babylon 5, which I've seen, and which is which is decent, and George Martin's show, which I've seen the pilot of Doorways, which is better, is that they they are all bourgeois entertainments. And they are all done for the purpose of making you feel better about who you are. Science fiction, uh, at, at base and at its most powerful, is not put was not is not here to reassure you. Okay. Is it not a mother's job to reassure you about how <laughs> I, you feel about I, I who you are? That, that is the essence of nurturing. Guys. I say that Karen. <laughs> no, but listen, but it's not the me, essence of art. Excuse me. Okay. Time out. It is. I I think that Karen is correct in the sense that science fiction has. If it is a yuppie thing, then part then the yuppie phenomenon is a feminized phenomenon in the sense that science fiction used to be about statistics, ideas, hard things, machines, and now it's beginning to be about, you know, even, even the shows were. And now the shows are about making people feel good. It's about feelings. I really do think that there is a cycle of growth in terms of feminine influence. I mean, I think that America oh, yeah. flexed the ultimate masculine muscle during I, World War II. I really think that if you look at the at, uh, thing in science fiction in terms of masculine and femininity, that uh, I mean, it's not it's it's not something that, that I agree with. I think that if you look at, for instance, the old Twilight Zone and the new Twilight Zone, you don't see a matter of femininity. You see a matter of like we on the new Twilight Zone is that we are we when I say we as writers or or, or or as a class, they were afraid to make you angry or to make you think the way that Sterling and George Clayton Johnson and these other people were not afraid to do on network television in the late 50s and early 60s. It has nothing to do with masculinity no. or femininity, but it has, it has to do with philosophical purpose. I think that in terms of the difference between the old Twilight Zone and the new Twilight Zone, it had to do with the fact that one of them had Rod Serling. Is and Rod Serling was not afraid to speak his mind. Well, and, neither was, and, and everything funneled through that one sensibility. He picked, he picked everything. But that's, that's right. But, I mean, it's like... On, on these shows that I'm, that I'm talking about, n I mean, I don't even think that Sterling was like that deep a thinker. But I, I think it's very hard to do that in like 30 minutes, you know, because he was telling morality plays, but the morality plays that we're seeing uh, that are science fiction now, are n the purpose is not to broaden your sense of perceptions. And so that's why I think that if you look at it with m in terms of masculine, masculine and femininity, that is just mis. I think it's misanalyzing that particular hmm. aspect. Okay, I okay, that I is, mean, is that, yes, that's the way art feels, right. and that's yeah. completely valid from the feel of it. Right. I would tend to say that there is feelings, a greater facts. a greater <laughs> emphasis. <laughs> feelings, if in the world of yin and of what is yin and what is yang, the mas a masculine characteristic would be logic. A feminine characteristic would be emotion. So to the degree that emotions are now considered to be more important than or a more central part of the show than just logical structure, that is the, port that is the degree to which we would, for the sake of discussion, consider it to be feminized as opposed to masculinized. It's pulling into the world of well, feelings. Well, it, it might be that I just, I just disagree with the semantics. That's fine. That you're all... Yeah. That you're Sounds like I don't, I don't yeah. really think that... I mean, like, I, I think it's, it's sort of difficult for men to think that they are devoid mm -hmm. of emotion. No, nobody said that. Yeah. Because what we're, our point no, is no, no. That, we're, that we're mostly just human beings. Right. You uh -huh. know, the male aspect, the part that where there is kind of a shift, that 51% thing is that shift towards the logical, mm -hmm. immediate, let's take care of this problem, who cares what we feel about it. And the feminine shift, that little 1%, is not the most, because most of you is just a human being, is that uh -huh. I 
feel this way, share my feelings with me before I tell you about this particular problem thing. It has nothing to do, human beings feel both.